Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for the uh, operating systems class. Um, in this video we're going to look at um, software mechanisms or basically operating system mechanisms for implementing uh, concurrency or mutual exclusion uh, mechanisms, all right? So um, hopefully you're watching the, the series of videos. Um, in the previous video um, we, we, we identified several disadvantages of the development of hardware machine instructions for synchronization and mutual exclusion, okay? So, um, uh, the, the busy waiting problem, okay, so, so with the machine instructions we still had to do busy waiting, you know, CPU cycles had to be used to continually check whether um, a lock was available yet or not, or a lock variable, basically. Um, and um, starvation, okay, so we had no way of guaranteeing that that there was some ordering mechanism for allowing process in the critical section using the hardware um, machine instructions. Okay, so we can we can address these shortcomings with the operating system. So the operating system can um, block a process instead of having it busy wait if it wants to enter a critical section but it's already locked. Okay, and likewise the operating system like like it keeps a ready queue. Um, for processes that are waiting to run and maybe uses a round-robin scheduling for fairness. Um, the operating system can keep a queue for processes that are waiting to enter a critical section um, and round-robin them to ensure that, that every process gets a chance at the critical section. All right. Um, so, if you read our textbook, you need to read all the sections about the, the different uh, uh, software mechanisms that operating systems implement. I'm only going to talk about semaphores in this video. So our objective is to uh, look at the, the software mechanisms that the operating system provides to, to manage concurrency. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll look at semaphores. You need to read about the others um, from our textbook. Um, and, and kind of at the end, though, we want to make certain that you know the connection between the hardware instructions that are provided and then how the operating system uses, uses those to uh, build these software mechanisms to support uh, synchronization, um, like a semaphore, okay? Um, so... A semaphore, uh, the, a pseudocode of a semaphore looks something like this, okay? So think of a semaphore as like a, a C structure, okay? So it's got a couple of, piece of pieces of data that it, that it manages in order to implement the semaphore. Uh, the basic one is a count and it has a queue, okay? So it uses the queue to keep track of, of which processes have been waiting first, second, and third to enter um, a critical section, okay? Um, and for the, the what's known as the counting semaphore, it just keeps a count. Okay, this, this is a little bit like the the, the lock variable that we were using um, for the hardware machine instructions, but it differs slightly. So, so I'll show you how. Basically, um, if the count is positive, that means that the um, semaphore should be considered um, um, available. And if, if the count becomes zero, um, and if it's less than zero. Um, so, sorry, if the count is zero or, or positive, then it's available. As soon as it becomes negative, then it should be considered uh, unavailable, all right? And, and something needs to block and wait on it, okay? So normally, the, the normal way we use a counting semaphore is we initialize the count to one. The first process that, that acquires this will decrement the count and will enter immediately. But then a second process, uh, if the first process hasn't released, hasn't signaled the semaphore, um, the count will become negative and the operating system will block it. Okay, so the way, so if you look at the, the same way, the SIM4 has two primitives, so you can think of this as a function based way of, of doing synchronization. So we call SIM wait in order to acquire a lock, basically. Um, and yeah, again, if the lock becomes unavailable when count becomes negative, then we're going to push the process onto our queue that, that called this and the operating system is going to put the process to sleep or, or put it into a blocked state waiting for the uh, semaphore um, to become available. Okay? And then when, when you're ready to release a semaphore, you send a sim signal. That's, that's equivalent to doing a release. And basically what you do is you increment the count and then if the count 
you know, the, the count could be negative. I mean, if I've got 10 processes that are currently blocked waiting on the semaphore, the count would be like negative 10. But at some point, when, when the count becomes zero, that means that, that, that um, whenever the count is, is less than or equal to zero, that means that there are processes waiting on there, okay? So um, we need to take the next process from the front of the queue if we're just going to use simple round-robin queuing um, and unblock that. So open it up. So, so unblock it, um, right? One important thing to note here, basically what happens when you call sim wait, if, if the process is, is going to need to be blocked because the, the, the semaphore is not available, basically what happens when you call sim wait is the, the function doesn't return, okay? So later on, some other process will um, call some signal, and the operating system will unblock one process, whichever process is at the front of the queue, and that will cause um, this function block to finally return. Okay, so, so once the process works its way to the front of the queue waiting on the semaphore and gets unblocked by the operating system, block returns, and then the sim wait returns, and then you enter the critical section. Um, so that the previous was, was was known as a general semaphore or a counting semaphore. Um, there's also a variation called a binary semaphore, which is similar. For a binary semaphore, as the name implies, it only takes on a value of, of a binary value, zero or one. And if it's one, then the semaphore is available. So if we call sim wait and the value is one, we set it to zero, making the semaphore unavailable, and we just enter. But if the value is already zero, then uh, we have to block. That means something else um, is already um, in the um, um, in the um, the semaphore. Okay. And and then there's a similar structure for the sim signal. Okay. One thing I forgot to mention for both of these though. Uh, so again, I've, we've written these, and the textbook has written these as C pseudocode. All right. And, and, and it, it is actually going to be code. So the operating system is going to write this as code. You know, it might be C, actually. In fact, you can look it up in Linux and find the implementations of the weight and the signal for the semaphore. But you have to think of these functions as happening atomically, okay? So it, it's not possible if I'm in the middle of, uh, of calling sim weight that I can get interrupted um, and go into another sim weight or sim signal for another process before I've, you know, after I've decommitted an account, but before I've checked it, okay? So, so these, these execute atomically, okay? Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that at the very end of the video here, all right? So um, you ought to be aware of the difference between a strong and versus a weak semaphore. Um, a strong semaphore is just simply one that uses, that has a queue and uses it to, um, to enforce an ordering in order to guarantee that no starvation occurs. So I've already talked about this quite a bit. So the simplest is um, we just use round robin um, on the queue for the semaphore, right? Which will guarantee that a process will eventually, you know, every process is ordered from the one that's been waiting the longest on the semaphore, and then the, the one that's been waiting the longest would get selected next to enter the semaphore, okay? Um, I mean, you can use different mechanisms so you could do priority based to enter the, the, the semaphore and other things. You, know, so. you can have weak semaphores that are useful in some contexts, um, but yeah, basically, if, if you don't enforce an ordering on allowing processes uh, uh, you know, uh, into the semaphore, so if there's no guarantee about the ordering, then, then you can't prevent starvation. Right? But in, in some contexts, you don't need to, to prevent that, um, so weak semaphores can be useful. Okay, so how would you use a semaphore? Um, if, so, so we haven't talked about how to implement it, but, but if we had a semaphore, basically the sim weight and the sim signal provide the acquire and the release that we talked about, all right? So the basic pseudocode would look, you know, if we have a semaphore called S, um, and if we just want to use it for a basic lock, uh, we would start off with the semaphore count to being one, like I mentioned, right? So notice, notice we initialize the semaphore's count to one. Um, and then we just do, do a wait any time we want, before we want to enter a critical section that the semaphore is protecting. And we do the signal uh, when we want to um, you know, um, release the lock. All right? 
And that's all you need for a critical section for using a setup form. Um, so just a quick example of how that works. Let's say we have three processes, A, B, and C, that are using a common semiform. So again, notice that the value of, of the count starts off as 1, so we initialize it as 1. So let's say A is the first one to call sim weight. So in this previous um, pseudocode, uh, process A or process 1, however you want to think about it, is the first one to enter uh, and call the weight on the semiform. Right? So the first process to enter, if, if you go back and look at the pseudocode for sim weight, will decremate the count to zero, but it won't block. Okay, so as long as the count um, is greater than is is has to be negative before we do the code that causes it to block. So so the, the first process that calls that would would immediately enter the critical section. Okay. Um, and let's say, so what this is supposed to indicate is that, let's say A gets interrupted before it exits the critical section, okay, and let's say B runs that and calls sim weight. So at that point, when B calls sim weight, it will decrement the count to negative 1, but when the count is negative, that causes the operating system to block the process, okay, and put it onto the semaphore key. So this is supposed to represent the queue for our semaphore S, so B ends up at the front of the queue, and, and the count ends up being negative 1. And, and B gets blocked. And then, then if C runs and C calls sim weight, it decrements down to negative 2, um, and it gets put onto the queue behind B. All right? And notice the count is negative 2. So the, the, the magnitude of this negative value is going to correspond to the number of processes on the, on the, the queue waiting for the semaphore. All right? Eventually, A should run. Um, you know, since B and C are blocked, they will never run until the operating system unblocks them. Okay? But, but A will come back and run, will call signal. Signal will decrement the, um, or sorry, will increment the, the count. So it'll go from negative 2 to 1. And since the count is negative, it'll take the next process off the head of the, uh, the queue waiting for that semaphore, and it will unblock it. So in this case, B would be unblocked, and, and it would run, right? And B, you know, again, this is going to guarantee that B is the next one to run because... C is blocked. C won't get woken up again uh, until uh, another signal happens. And even if A enters the, the, the semaphore, um, it's going to get blocked and be put on the queue behind uh, C, right? And, and, you know, eventually, you know, B would come back and be run uh, before C and A in that case, all right? Um, okay, so... I want to show a, a, a slightly more complex example of using a semaphore. Um, this is using this is working with what's known as the producer-consumer problem. This talked about in our textbook in this chapter. Um, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly here, so, so you might have to read the, the the textbook for details on this. But the producer-consumer problem is basically the description of it is that there's one or more producers. Okay, so this is a concurrency, a problem of concurrency. So we can have one producer or we're going to have multiple producers, and they're generating data and placing the data in a shared buffer for processing, okay? And then there's one or more consumers. So at a minimum, though, it's still a concurrency problem because there's one producer and one consumer, but there could be more of each. And the consumers are basically just taking items, items out of the shared buffer and then processing them, okay? Um, so some requirements, um, basically whenever we're putting items into the buffer or taking them out, we have to be careful because those aren't atomic. So we have to be constrained anytime we're doing things like appending to the buffer or um, 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 taking out of the buffer that uh, we protect that with a critical section, okay? So only one agent, a producer or consumer, can access the buffer at any given time. There's other problems. So we're going to show you, semaphore can be used for more than just um, defining a lock around a critical section. So, so we've got some synchronization or some signaling that has to happen here. So if the, the, it, when the, bu if the buffer is, is finite, you know, we have to prevent pr producers from adding into a full buffer. Okay? If the buffer is full, we can't allow the producers to keep running and overrun memory or overrun the buffer. Likewise, if the buffer is empty, we, we need to block consumers from um, taking items out of, trying to take an item out of an empty buffer, okay? Um, so 
so the pseudocode for the, the I mean, our, our buffer, you know, you can think of this just just a regular array in C of, of some items that, that get put into the buffer and taken out of the buffer, okay? Now, I'm first going to not worry about, uh, you know, so it's not realistic to have a, a buffer with an infinite amount of memory, okay? But, but let's, let's ignore that um, to start with. So let's say our buffer is just infinitely big, all right? Um, but so, so we need two pointers for this buffer um, so that the producer knows whenever it produces a new item where it needs to put something into the buffer, and the consumer knows whenever it's taking an item out where the, the, the back is, right, that where the last item is, so, so it can take items out of the buffer, right? Um, so this is kind of pseudocode for what the producer and consumer might be doing, but, but these would be the things that would have to be protected by a critical section because in both of these cases, we're manipulating the buffer. We're, you know, we're, we're reading or writing values in and out of the buffer, and we're uh, manipulating these in and out pointers to increment them or decrement them, okay? So, um, and also, uh, we do need to, to check... The consumer needs to check whether the buffer is empty or not and not do anything. So we would also like to get rid of this busy waiting. Okay, so, so instead of, 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 you know, when in is equal to out, um, that means that there's nothing in the buffer. So initially, when the buffer is empty, in and out start both at zero. That, that means that the buffer is empty. Okay? So, so we, could, we could check and, and just continually, you know, check and check and check um, until the buffer becomes not empty before we move on and, and um, um, get an item out of the buffer. So um, here's a possible solution. Uh, again, we're just ignoring the problem about a finite buffer or a constrained buffer here. Uh, but here we're, we're going to use semaphores, okay? Um, now, uh, and, and we just have a single, uh, or actually we have two semaphores uh, in this case. The, the, the lock semaphore does what, you're, what we've been using semaphores um, up to this point for. It's just a mechanism for mutual exclusion to, to define a, a critical section, okay? Um, and we're using a binary semaphore in this case, so we, we initialize it to one, um, which uh, initially means that the lock is available, okay? So nothing is in the critical section yet. Uh, we're going to use a second semaphore to signal between the producer and the consumer um, when um, the buffer is empty or not, okay? So, so we need to make certain that when the buffer is empty that the produce, that the consumer doesn't try and take an item out of an empty buffer, okay? And we're going to use another semaphore to do that, all right? Or we're going to try to. Um, so, and we've got a variable in that's also a global variable that we need to protect uh, with our lock semaphore, which just keeps track of the number of items in the buffer. Um, and basically what we do with that is that if, if, if the number for the producer, if we produce an item and the number of items goes from 0 to 1, so, so we find out that n is 1 after we increment it, that means that the buffer went from being empty to being full, or well, to, to, to being non-empty, I should say, right? So in that case, we're going to send a signal uh, using the delay semaphore, uh, which could potentially wake up um, a consumer that, that was waiting, that, that had found that the buffer was empty and was waiting for it to become non-empty, okay? So, so when we use a semaphore for a lock, we, have, we always have a corresponding wait before the critical section and then a signal on that semaphore after. So there always needs to be a matching uh, signal for every wait that we do. So for this delay signal, the, the, matching, um, uh, the, the, the matching wait for the signal happens in the consumer. Okay. So the consumer, consumer waits on the delay semaphore, uh, and initially the delay semaphore is set to zero, which means that it's unavailable, or it's, it's locked, basically, because initially the buffer is empty. Okay? So if the consumer were to run first, it would do a wait on the delay, and it would end up being blocked at that point until somebody signaled that the buffer was non-empty. Right? So that, that's how this is supposed to work. But um, the, the, this um, code using the binary semaphore has a uh, bug in it, okay? So I'm going to kind of just jump right to the bug. Um, 
So if you look at that code, basically what happened, so if the producer ran first and, and added an item, and it would, um, you know, so it would get into the critical section and then it would, then it would exit the critical section. But notice it didn't call delay to, to, to show that, um, uh, so we, we interrupted it before it called delay here, okay? So uh, even though the buffer was non, um, is now non-empty, um, I'm sorry, it, it called delay, uh, forget that. So yeah, it, it called delay as well, okay? So, so if, if we switch over to the consumer, um, it, it would then um, get past that because um, the, 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 the producer has, has indicated with the delay semaphore that the buffer now has some values. It would enter the critical section. It would take an atom out and decrement it, okay? So, so the, the bug happens here because let's assume that we get process switched. So after we exit the critical section and we've decremented the count to zero, we get process switched before um, the consumer checks the value of zero, okay? So, so if I can just go back to the code real quickly here, the problem is is that uh, in needs to only be used and accessed inside of the critical section, and we decrement in in the consumer, but we, we exit the critical section by signaling the lock, and then we test the value of zero, and that causes the problems here because uh, we're doing something with a shared memory value, but we're not doing it atomically inside of our critical section. So um, if, if the producer added a value and incremented, and then we went back over to the consumer, the problem here, j just to, to jump to it, so I won't go through this step by step, but um, because we had a mismatch between signals and weights on this delay, um, it's going to turn out that um, uh, if you step through this now, that um, the consumer will end up incorrectly uh, try, you know, trying to read from an empty buffer. So that, that's why in becomes negative one here, because it incorrectly did a read and a decrement, um, uh, even though the buffer was empty at this point, right? Because of this mismatch between our, our signal and our weight on the delay signal here, so. So um, we could still use a, a binary semaphore and correct that. So again, this is just emphasizing that any any time you have the variables that are you know shared data, um, it's unsafe to be manipulating them outside of a critical section, right? Um, um, so we can fix that particular bug with a binary semaphore just by uh, inter introducing a local variable m. So then when the consumer decrements in. We just remember what the value of, of the, you know, what, what the number of items are then the buffer is at that point, right? M equals N. So that even if, um, you know, we exit the critical section, uh, whatever the value was, we will correctly call the, the weight. You know, if, if, if N became zero, we can't get interrupted and get in incremented again before we call the weight that we need to here, okay? Um, You might ask, okay, why didn't we just put this, you know, inside the critical section? But that's that's uh, a non-starter as well. That's a bug because basically what would happen then is if this was inside the critical section, um, if the buffer became the, the first time the buffer became zero, so it went from um, from non-empty to empty, we would call a wait on delay and we'd be, become blocked. But notice we're still inside of the critical section. So the producer would never be allowed into the critical section to put an item back into the buffer to make it non-empty, okay? So that would cause a deadlock immediately if, if ever it was the case that the buffer went from being uh, non-empty to empty and, and the consumer blocked on that, okay? So that's definitely not a solution, all right? There's actually a simpler solution just using a counting semaphore. So, um, uh, so we've already shown, you know, the delay semaphore can be used for, for signaling, not just for providing a, an acquire and release mechanism around a critical section, okay? So we could also use the, the other semaphore. Um, in this case, if we use a counting semaphore for n, instead of having n being an integer, we can, we can use the count value of the semaphore um, um, to keep track of, of whether the, the buffer is empty or non-empty, okay? Um, and 
then if you work through that, then, then uh, that will fix the problem as well. Okay? So it, it provides a simpler solution than using a binary semaphore, just using in as a counting variable, okay? as, as a counting semaphore. Um, okay, and then kind of finally, um, in the real world, I mean, we can't have an infinite memory buffer, all right? So we would have to use a... Um, uh, some sort of a finite buffer. And the, the normal way that you do that is you use a, a finite circular buffer. So you just define a buffer of some maximum size n, and then when you're putting items in, you wrap around, right? So if, if I've gotten to the end, then I would wrap uh, in around and start putting back at the beginning again, right? So in this case, the buffer, you have to check whether the buffer is, is not only empty, like we were doing before, but you have to also worry about the case when the buffer becomes full. So when, the, when in comes up here and bumps into out, um, you have to stop the producer from adding another item in there or just stop, start overriding values in your buffer, okay? So again, I won't spend time on this. Um, um, you know, so, so now we've, we've got both for the producer and the consumer, both have to be making a check um, um, whether either the buffer is full, so so we we don't we don't put stuff in things when the when the buffer is full. The producer shouldn't put things in when it's full, um, and the consumer still shouldn't take things try to take things out when it's empty. Okay. Um, and uh, and yeah, I won't go into details of this. Uh, you can look at the the slide or, or the the code from the textbook. So, but, but the general thing is, li like we just did for the finite buffer solution where we had a semaphore in in order to signal the empty um, and non-empty condition, we can add a, yet a third semaphore. I called it full. Um, and, and notice the, the difference is that initially full starts off with a value account at the size of the buffer. And then um, full is going to get signaled by the consumer every time it takes an item out in order to decrement that. Okay. And then uh, the producer is going to wait on full. Um, and so if that ever becomes zero, that means that, that the buffer is full uh, and that the producer needs to be blocked uh, until the consumer can take some items out and, and uh, make some room so the producers can add some items. All right? So that, that's basically how kind of these three semaphores work. Um, all right. And then as a final thing, so remember, I, I, I already mentioned that um, you should keep in mind that the implementation by the operating system of the sim weight and the sim signal need to be atomic. So if you were to actually go and look at Linux for the implementation of the Linux semaphore, and you found the sim weight, you would find um, in the, the, the sim weight function, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a C function, it's written in C. But the very first thing that, that's done is you'll find that there's a, a compare and swap machine instruction that's used, uh, both for the sim weight and the sim signal, okay? So basically, what, what's done by the operating system to implement the semaphore mechanism, um, we add another variable, like a flag variable, and, and we use this like we did in the previous video. So this is just a, a, a value in memory. Um, and we would initialize this um, to a one, so I didn't. Sh I should put that in my code somewhere. Somewhere here. So when, when we create the semaphore, we have to set the flag to one, mean that, meaning that the semaphore, meaning that we're neither nobody is in the critical section for sim weight or sim signal. Okay. So again, this is only being used with the hardware instruction to make the sim weight and the sim signal functions atomic. All right. So so we can't interrupt in the middle. An another process can't call sim weight or sim signal in the middle. Well while something is already in the, in, in the middle of, of, of a different one, all right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so again, I mean, the, the operating system has to busy wait here, but, you know, this code is relatively small for, for the wait and the signal implementation, so, so, so performance-wise, it's not too bad to have a slight busy wait, but that's how the operating system builds on the hardware instructions Right, um, so it can use that to make these functions atomic, um, and then of course, um, regular programs or threads can then use the operating system semaphores um, um, to implement 
full-blown concurrency and synchronization with blocking and no busy waiting, except for this little bit that the operating system needs to use with the machine instruction. All right, um, all right so that's it um, for... Um, for concurrency mechanisms, I hope, hope that makes uh, sense. Uh, at this point, what you should do is you should go read about monitors and some of the other uh, mechanisms that are common in operating systems besides SIMFORS and understand the differences between uh, them and, and, and kind of how they're typically used. All right, so um, that's it for this video, and I will see you then in the next video.